produce the kind of author who can make complex economic um, uh, programs understandable to the rest of us. Uh, in this case, he, he describes how Washington works in a way that enables the rich to become richer, how, how programs that are designed to pull people out of poverty really end up becoming a little more than tax breaks for the wealthy. David is the senior fellow and director of the Hutchins uh, Center for Fiscal and Monetary Policy at the Brookings Institution. He spent some 30 years as a journalist at the Wall Street Journal and as the author of two previous New York Times bestsellers. And we're delighted tonight to have him in conversation with David, another David, David Rubenstein. David Rubenstein is a businessman, a lawyer, a philanthropist, he is, uh, from our standpoint at the Carter Library, one of the most important jobs because he's a former deputy uh, domestic policy advisor in the Carter administration. He was the co-founder and co-executive chairman of the private equity firm, the Carlisle Group, uh, chairman of a number of organizations now and in the past, whether it's the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts or the Smithsonian or the Council for Foreign Relations. Um, and I might also say he is an author of a number of books, the latest book, uh, The American Experiment, Dialogues on a Dream, which uh, was featured in a program uh, here in Atlanta uh, with Acapella Books earlier this month. Uh, for our viewers, you'll get a chance to ask questions a little bit later. If you'll notice on the uh, Zoom webcast down at the bottom, there's a Q&A box where you can write your questions and we'll get to those uh, in just a little, little bit later. But for now, uh, Mr. Wessel, Mr. Rubenstein, welcome. Um, we are pleased to, to have you all here. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, and I want to thank the Carter Library for making this possible, as well as Acapella Books. Uh, I should disclose at the beginning a few connections. I am an admirer of uh, David Wessel. I would consider myself a friend of David's. I am on the board of Brookings, where uh, the uh, Hutchin Center is at. And I, um, I should also disclose that in my private investment uh, world, I, my family office is uh, contemplating making an investment in a opportunity zone. So I'll find out uh, if I live long enough whether it's a good deal or not for people like me, but we'll find out. So why don't we go through what this is all about, and I hope we can educate people about what opportunity zones are, the pluses and minuses, and the controversy associated with it. So David, uh, how long did it take you to write this book? Well, it's about a year and a half. Uh... I got interested in it first in the spring of 2019. Okay, and um, you are um, somebody that uh, found it easy to, to write about this in the sense that you have a background in finance, of course, and you've written a lot about financial subjects, but was it one thing that precipitated your interest in this? Yes, one of my colleagues at Brookings, Adam Looney, who's an economist, former Obama administration treasury official, is one of those guys who, uh, is always looking at tax bills as they move through Congress. And uh, uh, Adam spotted the Opportunity Zone provision. Uh, he was exercised about it. I thought it was pretty interesting because I've long been interested in how we can use public policy to deal with left behind areas. So I thought this is a interesting kind of Brookings white paper kind of thing. And then he mentioned that Sean Parker of Napster and Facebook fame, the guy who Justin Timberlake played in the movie Social Network was behind it. And suddenly I thought, well, this is more than some public policy story. This is just a good story. So that's what attracted me initially. Okay. So uh, to go back before this bill became law or this idea became law in the Trump Tax Act, uh, have there been programs before in the federal government where uh, the federal government said to people, if you invest in an area, you'll get some special benefit? Has that ever happened before? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is an idea that's been kicking around Washington since the early 1980s. Jack Kemp, the former congressman and HUD secretary, uh, proposed something called enterprise zones that got a lot of attention, so much attention that a lot of people think that became law, although it never did. There were some state programs with that name. But over time, 
there have been programs, uh, the, the most recent, the Clinton administration had some empowerment zones. And most recently, there's one called New Markets Tax Credit, which does provide incentives for people who have money to put money into communities that need money. That's the general idea. The difference between opportunity zones and all those previous programs is the previous ones had caps set by Congress. So there was a limit to how much money could be invested, how much money the treasury would forego. And as a result of those caps, somebody, mostly the treasury, the community development financial institutions unit at the treasury would have some say as to whether projects were worthy or not, or intermediaries were worthy or not. The big difference with opportunity zones, or one big difference is there is no limit. There's 8,764 opportunity zones and as much money as people with capital gains want to invest in them can go there. And there's very little oversight from the treasury. And that was by design because Sean Parker and the people who he hired to help them with things thought that the previous programs had suffered from too much oversight, too much regulation and too much red tape. So um, your book, in my view, which is excellent, is a way that people can see how Washington operates, how you can get something into uh, a bill and a law, and also how one person can have a big impact in making something a law. So let's talk about Sean Parker a moment. Uh, Sean Parker, as you uh, just noted earlier, was somebody who uh, was one of the founders of well, Facebook. I guess he was the first president of Facebook. Um, what did he do after he left Facebook? And why was he so interested in this idea? And how did somebody who lives in Beverly Hills uh, have an impact on legislation in Washington, which is really very specific tax legislation? How did he do that? Well, so um, Sean Parker has been, as far as I can tell, a successful investor uh, uh, since he uh, got canned at Facebook. He didn't last there very long, but he got enough stock to get pretty rich. And he's done lots of investing. Some of it's worked, some of it hasn't. Um, he has a long-standing interest in a few things. One of them is cancer. And uh, he's uh, invested a lot of money philanthropically in using immunotherapy to fight cancer. What, as I understand it, and from what he told me, um, he, uh, the idea originally came to him when he was in Africa. And he thought that there were so many places in Africa that needed money. And there was so much money, private money on the sidelines and there was no way that foreign aid was ever going to make up the gap. So that was his initial instinct. But he got talked out of that, and he became interested in how in the United States, there were big places, parts of the country that, didn't, that needed capital and didn't get it. He was actually more interested in capital to businesses than to real estate, but that's not how Opportunity Zones worked out. Um, he... Uh, He's a smart guy and smart enough to know that he needed to hire some people who knew what they were doing. So um, he and his sidekick, a guy named Michael Polanski, uh, talked originally to Ro Khanna, who was a, a Democrat in Silicon Valley, uh, who, who asked him to take over this thing. And Ro Khanna said, no, thanks. I'm going to run for Congress, which he did. And on his second try, he won. And Khanna suggested he talk to a guy named Steve Glickman, who was in the Obama White House. and and Parker hired Glickman, and he also hired a guy named John Letary, a Republican, who'd come from a trade association that lobbies for uh, U.S. units of foreign multinationals. And he basically uh, empowered them, gave them the money to set out to, A, make the case that geographic inequality is a big problem in America, which they did very successfully, and then to come up with this is the solution to that problem, opportunity zones. Now, many wealthy business people um, working at large companies or on their own, they try to get legislation through, particularly in the tax world, that might benefit them personally. But Sean Parker wasn't looking to make money from this himself, was he? Uh, no. In fact, he told me, and he's very strong about it, that he hasn't invested in opportunity zones. And, you know, one of the editors on the book said to me, like, well, that's outrageous. If he believes in this, he should invest in them. And I said, well, this is a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. I think Parker, in my view, wisely decided that if he could promote this as good public policy and not take advantage of it himself, he wouldn't be accused of lining his own pocket. Um, but what he did do was um, he's a charming guy. 
And I think there were a couple of things that distinguish him from other people who uh, lobby for tax provisions in Washington. One, as you point out, although he was uh, advocating something that helps people like him, his peers who have a lot of money, and uh, he, but he was very good at going around and talking to members of Congress, partly I'm sure because he became very generous in campaign contributions and diversified his contributions from Democrats to Republicans. But he enjoyed talking to members of Congress about this. And I was struck by something that John Letiri told me. He said, well, he's taken lots of CEOs around to congressional offices and they all knew it was important, but they didn't really enjoy it. But Parker was an exception. He actually enjoyed it. And I think that was part of the success in building it, what was initially a bipartisan coalition for this bill. The idea seemed you know, unassailable. Rich people have money, poor communities need money. If the government can give them a tax break to do it, why not? And I think that a lot of this happened because uh, it seemed appealing, but a lot of the co-sponsors didn't look at the details. Now, in tax legislation, which usually when a massive bill goes through a tax increase or a tax cut, the bill is probably a thousand pages long because everybody sticks anything they can think of in the bill. But the bill is usually written in the Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee but they look for guidance from the White House and from the Treasury. So did Sean Parker try to convince the White House and her Treasury this was a good idea? Um, that's, I don't, he may have talked to Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, but the way this got into law is what you said is, is the normal course of operations. Remember the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017 was done uh, much more behind the scenes than usual and much more rapidly than usual. And what uh, Parker and the Economic Innovation Group, the think tank had done successfully is get a couple of key Senate and House sponsors for the bill, including Cory Booker, the Democrat from New Jersey and Sean and uh, Tim Scott, the Republican from South Carolina. Uh, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act in the House, the original House version as it passed, did not have opportunity zones in it. Um, the, uh, the guy who was pushing it in the House, Pat T. Berry, an Ohio Republican, had hoped to be chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, lost out to Kevin Brady. Kevin Brady wasn't interested in this. And um, Paul Ryan, who was in general sympathetic to things like this, was, had other agendas. He wanted to clean up the tax code and avoid all these uh, special interest tax breaks. So it, it became law only because of Sean Park, uh, because of Tim Scott. Uh, Tim Scott was one of four Republican senators on the Senate Finance Committee who, who basically what, worked with Orrin Hatch, the chairman, to fashion this bill. And this was the thing he wanted in the bill. And Orrin Hatch knew he needed Tim Scott, and Tim Scott was there. So it got very little attention. There was so much furor about the size of the corporate tax cut in the Tax Cut and Jabs bill that no one was paying attention to this. And as you know, if you've looked at the book, uh, the White House was unenthusiastic initially, although there were a few people in the White House, like Kevin Hassett, who, who liked the idea. He was involved in the original uh, laying the foundation for it. Uh, when Charlottesville happened in 2017, the summer of 2017, those uh, demonstrations of people who wanted to take down the statue of Robert E. Lee, who were met with white nationalists and neo-Nazis, and there was violence and somebody died, uh, President Trump famously said that there were fine people on both sides. And that was too much for Tim Scott. And he, an African-American from South Carolina, he went very strong in his condemnation of the president. And the White House called him up and said, would you like to come to talk to the president about this? And, and Scott tells me, and he writes in his autobiography that he hesitated, but very few people turned down an invitation from the president. He went to the White House one-on-one, -on -one, um, it, uh, although uh, the vice president was there as well. He brought one of his aides, Tim Scott brought one of his aides, and he feared he was going to have a confrontation with President Trump, but the president was very conciliatory, listened to Tim Scott, and at some point in the conversation says, what can I do to make it up to the people I've offended, Black people? And Tim Scott says, well, you can support my Opportunity Zone legislation. That conversation led to a flurry of phone calls in the White House for people to find out what the hell opportunity zones were. The next day on Air Force One, the president was asked about his meeting with Tim Scott and told reporters he was in favor of the provision that, that uh, Tim Scott was pushing. 
I suspect that President Trump, who I've never talked to, understood immediately what this was because an idea, a tax break for real estate is something that we believe that something that Donald Trump was familiar with. Um, and so that isn't the reason it became law, but it is it was it contributed to be included in the bill. It later okay. got branded as a Trump tax cut. And the fact that Jared Kushner took a, advantage of it with some of his investments and Ivanka Trump talked it up, I think has been a problem for the proponents because it looks like a Trump deal and it was a Trump tax bill that was included in, but actually it started in a very bipartisan way. So uh, very often when people want to get provisions in a tax bill, they would argue this is going to help the country. Actually, revenue will come in from this. It won't cost us anything. So was there an analysis by Sean Parker and his EIG team that this was actually going to make money for the U.S. government or not cost money? Yeah, they were. Um, one of the things that Sean Parker did that was smart is he hired people who understood how the world works and how Washington works. And so they hired some technicians who helped them fashion a bill that in the 10 year window that Congress uses to evaluate the price tag of any law looks like it doesn't lose the Treasury very much money. What happens is the short version is if in order to play in the opportunity zone game, you have to have a capital gain as, as you, you do, David. If you invest in an opportunity, you invest the profits from that initial capital gain in an opportunity zone fund, you get to defer taxes, you get to reduce that initial capital gains tax. But more importantly, the money you put in an opportunity zone project is you don't have to pay any capital gains on any profits you make on that, provided you hold it for 10 years. So the big cost of the treasury, which I have no idea what it is, because I have no idea how much money is going to go into them, will come outside the 10 year window. But it was cleverly structured so that when the joint tax committee does their list of all the things, provisions in the bill, this one doesn't look like it costs very much because it had a little revenue blip in 2026 when people have to pay taxes on that initial capital gain. So to make it simple, uh, you have to have a capital gain, I think in this in the previous 12 months or, or is it 24 months? Um, okay. So you have to have a capital gain. Let's suppose you have a capital gain of $100. You made $100 and the capital gains rate is let's say 25%. So you would pay to the federal government uh, $25 out of that 100 that you made. Under this provision, you take that $100 um, that you were, you've made, the $100, you put it into an opportunity zone, which is to say you find an investment in one of these 8,000 opportunity zones, you put the $100 in, and I think for five years, you don't have to pay any tax on that $100. You don't have to pay if, any tax until 2026. That's right. Right. So then after five years, um, you've got to pay tax, but for that five years, you deferred the tax. Right. And paying and, taxes later is always better than paying. Sooner. Right. And then if you put the hundred million, the hundred dollars into that, into the opportunity zone, while you'll pay tax on that hundred dollars, any profits that you make in that opportunity zone, if you hold on to it for 10 years, you never pay tax. Is that the essence of it? That's the essence of it, but there's one extra benefit on that initial $25. You don't have to pay the $25. If you put the money in before the end of this year, you get a discount off of that. That's correct. 15%. So, uh, all right. So um, th this is moving forward. The president wants a big tax cut bill and everybody in Washington, everybody in the universe seems to be putting something in the bill. They call them a Christmas tree kind of bill. And so lots of things are being cut. Lots of things are being added. Uh, was this so far under the radar screen that it wasn't getting that much Press attention. And frankly, you, you know a fair bit about Washington. Had you heard of this before? Um, I hadn't heard of it before. They had gotten some attention, the Economic Innovation Group, because they'd done such a good job of laying the foundation that we have a problem with economic, in a, I mean, geographic inequality. As you know, at the, in, several years ago, there started to be concern about income inequality, the difference between the rich and the poor. But I think the notion of geographic inequality while it was always lurking in the background, was not very prominent. The notion that there are some communities that are really suffering and some that are doing much better. But some of the academic work and some of the politics was calling everything from J.D. Vance's book on, on Appalachia to David Otter's work on, on communities hit hard by the China shock really called attention to 
uh, geographic inequality. So um, they had managed to get some attention for that problem. And there had been some press around opportunity zones when the bill was originally introduced at the beginning of 2016. But there was no attention paid for it while this tax bill was moving in 2017 because there were so many bigger things in it. And in fact, it got in the bill because Tim Scott was influential and he wanted it in the bill. And the people who were in favor of opportunity zones knew that once Tim Scott convinced Orrin Hatch this should be in the bill, they should not talk about it. Because once you start talking about it, people saying, well, why are we doing this? And why am I not getting my special tax break? And isn't this trickle down economics? So in fact, the bill was signed by the president at the end of December, 2017. The first story in any national newspaper about opportunity zones didn't appear for a month, a full month, uh, until the end of January, 2017. So Orrin Hatch was then the chairman of the Senate uh, Finance Committee. And as the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, he can pretty much get what he wants in the bill. He's got to get his Republicans lined up. There weren't a lot of Democrats he had to worry about because they weren't going to get Democratic votes. But Tim Scott was very vital, as I understand it, because he's yes, a sir. Black Republican from South Carolina. So if you want to say to the Black community, look, this isn't bad for the Black community. We have Tim Scott. Uh, it worked quite well. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, the proponents actually had the perfect politically diversified portfolio. Remember, this bill is introduced in 2016. Among the most prominent sponsors are Democrat Cory Booker and Republican Tim Scott. They had no idea that Donald Trump was going to win the White House. In fact, I suspect, like many of us, they assumed that Hillary Clinton would win. And if Hillary Clinton had won, it would have been Cory Booker as the front man for this thing. So, right. But it did help disarm the notion that this was bad for uh, poor communities when you have people like Scott and Booker promoting it. So when the tax bill is passed, uh, President Trump has a big ceremony at the White House. He takes credit for the big tax cut. Does he talk about this at the signing ceremony? He doesn't talk about it, but uh, Tim Scott is there and Tim Scott talks about it. Right. Um, but even though he does that, nobody seems to notice. Well, I shouldn't say that. There are some people in the tax avoidance community, the lawyers and accountants, a few of them began to get it, but most of them didn't pay attention either initially. So in Washington, D.C., if you want something in a tax bill, ultimately you have to get the Joint Committee on Taxation to give a value into what it's going to cost. Did they have a value on how much this was going to cost or was it going to not cost anything because the revenue would be so great? It was going to, they said it would cost a couple billion dollars over 10 years because there was, as you described earlier, you have to pay capital gains tax in 2026 on that initial investment. The Joint Tax Committee did make some changes in the bill, uh, in the provision, but they were pretty stressed out. This bill was moving very fast. And there are a number of things in there, which in the committee report, which is the way that uh, um, uh, the Gen Tax Committee describes the way a tax provision is supposed to work. There's a number of footnotes that say, well, this is what appears to be intended, but the law is kind of vague on this. So it, the law was a little messy because it was done both by stealth and amid so much else going on. Now, for those who are watching, uh, it's not really required by the Budget Act of 1974, which was designed to keep the budget deficit low, uh, that we have 10-year budgeting. But we've used 10-year budgeting in these bills and all bills because you can say, well, it might cost you something in years one, two, or three, but the federal government will get it back in years eight, nine, and 10, just when the revenue comes back and the program kicks in. But of course, in years eight, nine, and 10, everybody else is gone and nobody's really paying attention to it. That's why the deficit keeps going up because these things don't really cost nothing. They actually cost something. But in any event, so the bill is passed. Uh, are there regulations that have to be... Um, uh, issued by the Treasury Department for this? There are. As with every tax bill, there's regulations. But first thing the Treasury had to do was figure out how to decide what uh, census tracts were eligible for opportunity zones. The law was had some criteria, uh, certain poverty level and stuff like that. Although it also said in an unusual feature that I think they've come to regret that contiguous census tracts, that is census tracts that wouldn't otherwise be eligible, would be eligible if they were next to one that was eligible. The Treasury came up with a list of census tracts that amounted to 56% of all the census tracts in America as being eligible. And then the way the law was written, 
It was up to the governors of the 50 states and the mayor of District of Columbia and the governor of Puerto Rico to pick from that list up to 25% of the census tracts that were eligible and designate them as opportunity zones. This, they got very little guidance from the treasury about what they, how they should do this. It was done very quickly because they only had 60 or 90 days to do it. Um, and so some of the governors made foolish decisions. Some of them made smart decisions. Some of them probably made corrupt decisions. And it was a tough thing for governors. I have a chapter in the book about the state of Oregon, which I picked as a case study for a couple of reasons. But one of them was that it was a kind of a clean process. There's no evidence of um, corruption. And there was a lot of information that had been obtained by the local newspaper on Freedom of Information Act. And you can see them thinking about, well, what do we do here? If we pick the worst census tracts in the state and Washington State and Idaho pick more attractive state, then we won't get any money. But if we pick the areas of, the, of Oregon that are already drawing money, well, they don't really need the tax break and we're gonna get a lot of bad publicity because they're gonna get money that don't need it. So they did 50-50. But in fact, most of the money I think went to those census tracts that probably didn't need the boost. Uh, I have a story in the book about the uh, downtown Portland where a Ritz-Carlton condo, condo and hotel complex is going out with opportunities. Okay. So normally when the federal government has a program and they give governors some discretion here, they gave them a lot, the federal government wants lots of reporting data to make sure they can understand exactly how the money is expended or not expended. Um, is that required under this law? No. So uh, you talked about the 10-year budget window. The other thing which everybody in Washington now is familiar with is the process known as reconciliation. And that's the process that allows you to pass a tax bill in the Senate with only 50 votes instead of the 60 that seems to be required for everything else these days. But the way reconciliation works, thanks to a rule called the Byrd Rule, uh, named after the former West Virginia Senator, things that don't touch spending and taxes it can get stripped out of the bill. And in this case, uh, the Democrats knew they couldn't defeat the bill, but they wanted to make life miserable for the Republicans. So they were prepared to object to everything in the bill that didn't raise or cost money. So what got stripped out was the provision in the bill that would have required reporting, would have required the Treasury to report to Congress on how this money was being used. It got kind of absurd. Bernie Sanders objected to the title of the bill. So the title of the bill was the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. He said under the Byrd rule, that doesn't raise or lower money. So that was stripped out. So if you look at the final bill, the one that went to the president, it's like a bill to implement the budget resolution X, Y, Z or something like that. The okay. treasury has done, asked the Opportunity Zone funds to make certain reports. Uh, they're not public yet. It's not clear how much will ever be public. Um, there is one, some people at the Joint Tax Committee that you mentioned earlier, some economists got to look at 2019 tax returns, at least those that were filed electronically, and they found that 84% of the opportunity zones got no money at all. Half the money went to the top 1% of zones, presumably the ones that were already drawing a lot of private investment, and the average income of individuals who invested in opportunity zones was $1.1 million. Okay, so the theory behind the law was that if you invest in opportunity zones, which are generally not great economic areas, these are ones that are struggling, that's the theory at least, the money going in, whether or not it's a tax benefit or not to the person putting it in, will help the district. That's the theory. But what happened, as I understand it, is that people um, invested in some things that might not have actually helped people in the district. And I want to make it clear uh, you can buy, you can invest in a real estate project in an opportunity zone district, but you also can just invest in a company that happens to be in that opportunity zone. It doesn't have to be new real estate. Is that right? That's right. And I think the original idea, Parker's idea was he was thinking business, but it turns out that it's the way it was written is particularly suited to real estate and it may not be well suited to business. Um, so, but what you said is exactly right. That was the theory. There are very few things that you cannot invest in. So you don't have to do affordable housing. You don't have to create any jobs for people who live in the community. You don't even have to assert that you're doing that. So while there are, I think the my bottom line is this can be and is being used for the stated purpose. And I have some examples of that in the book. I'm happy to talk about them. 
But since there is nothing to require that it be done that way, most of the money has gone to projects that really are, are not doing much good for the communities in which they were located. I mean, there's some outrageous examples of um, self-storage facilities, for instance. There's a little industry of self-storage facilities, which don't employ anybody. They're, it's fine, self-storage is great, but do we really want to give people a tax, capital gains tax break to put a self-storage thing in a, in a poor community? Luxury student rental housing is, is drawing some opportunities on money because some census tracts look poor because college kids show up on the census tally as having no income. And for some reason, some governors designated those census tracts as opportunity zones. So it turns out from reading your book that uh, it seems like everybody in the country has a storage unit somewhere uh, because everybody is uh, afraid that they're going to not keep these possessions that are so valuable, so they store them. Um, I don't think it's in your book, but my impression is that most people never actually open up the storage facilities to actually take the things out. Yeah, I think I, event, figured out, I think I figured out how many square feet of storage there is for each American. I don't know, but I think it's the people are afraid to throw. There is, there's some saying there's death, divorce, disaster, at least people to get them. But I think you're right. I think it's people who can't throw things away, so they rent a storage unit. So uh, your theory is in the book, as you say, while storage units might be nice, uh, people get divorced or they're moving or something, but... Is it really creating a lot of jobs? Because mostly you just have something sitting in a storage unit. It's not like jobs are being created all that much. Is that your theory? Yeah, no, that's a fact. Okay. So um, if you look at this, can you say that you found a few that you thought really were solving the social purpose intended, even if it costs more than it might have been originally intended? Did you find examples of people yes. who were building projects in opportunity zones and, and jobs were coming in? Is there any evidence of this or not? Yes. Well, yes. I mean, one knock you can make on the book is um, it's since there's no data, you're stuck with what some people deride as anecdotes and newspaper reporters call reporting. Um, so uh, I, my favorite example of what opportunity zones could be is in, in South LA, there's an outfit called Sola Impact that was started by an unusual guy. His name is Martin Wodo. He's a a uh, Nigerian immigrant who went to Wharton. He went into private equity, actually, David. Um, but he was dabbling with real estate on the side and decided to go into real estate. And his idea was that there was a lot of undervalued properties in poor neighborhoods in Los Angeles that could be, you could make money at it if you treated the tenants decently. So he had hundreds of small, well, hundreds of units in several small apartment buildings mostly rented to Section 8 voucher people, people who get a federal subsidy to rent. Um, and he had raised quite a bit of money over the years, uh, uh, tens of millions of dollars, not David Rubenstein style money. Um, and somebody came to him, some people who were involved in Opportunity Zones and said, half your territory is an Opportunity Zone, you ought to get into this game. And he was really reluctant because he had avoided all sorts of government programs, partly for the reasons that the Opportunity Zone proponents said that like it's just too much red tape. But when he was, he was, they came back a second time and he realized that this was really something for him. And he, he raised, he formed an opportunity fund. He raised $115 million in 12 weeks. And he's using that for affordable housing and a small business incubator in bad neighborhoods of LA. And he's become like a leader in the movement to say, this is what this project could this, up tax break could do if you use it wisely. But I'm afraid that that is not the majority of the money. So it's my point is, can this be used for good? Absolutely. Is it being used for good? Absolutely. But there's nothing to require that it be used to good. And as a result, investors who are looking for high return, low risk investments are going to put money in office buildings and hotels that really and condo complexes that really aren't what we were sold when the bill was sold. Okay, so if somebody reads your book, they would say, well, maybe the federal government made a mistake. Wouldn't be the first time the federal government made a mistake in a program in Congress. So maybe we should eliminate it and just say, well, it was a good idea, but now it doesn't really work quite the way that we thought it was too expensive. Is that likely to happen? I don't think so. Um, I think that it does have, it does have some bipartisan origins. It got kind of tainted by the Trump embrace of it. And the president himself 
talked about opportunity zones constantly every time he was asked, what is he doing for African Americans? So he pushed this and it got branded by him. But I think it has a constituency, some Democrats in Congress and a number of mayors and senators. So I think it's unlikely to be repealed. What I it, So I think there's three ways this could go. One is it's repealed. And you could say, look, it's crazy to try and use the tax code with all its intricacies and all these people who make their living finding ways to exploit the tax code. If you want to get money to poor neighborhoods, raise taxes on rich people and let the government give them the money. So that's one alternative. And I think there's some sentiment for that these days in Washington. Another alternative would be to see if, if we could uh, fix the law so we get rid of the worst abuses. And I think that that's what Parker, well, I know, that's what Parker thinks should happen. You know, when you come from the world of Silicon Valley, you're used to doing software 1.0 and software 2.0 and software 3.0. And so I think he thought, he thinks we should be able to fix the bill. The problem is in Washington, especially if something becomes controversial, it's hard to fix because some people want to kill it and some people want to make it richer. Um, there are some interesting, I mean, so you could remove the zones that don't really shouldn't be there. You could uh, allow governors to repick. You could set tighter rules on what is an opportunity zone and what could be invested in them. Uh, Ron Wyden has a bill that would, you could only do housing if a certain percentage was affordable housing. And there are some states that have done interesting things. In the District of Columbia, if you want to get the tax break as a district resident for a project in the district, it has to be certified by the city. And you have to meet certain criteria to show that it's actually helping people. Um, but that's not the way it works in every place. So um, my experience in Washington is that when people vote for something, they rarely say, you know, I made a mistake uh, a year or two ago, and I'm just going to change my vote. Is that your experience as well? Yes, yes. So I think some people who were for opportunity zones, Democrats, who didn't vote for them because they nobody voted for the, uh, none Democrat voted for the tax cut and jobs bill, they've kind of soured on it. Um, they might not admit it was a mistake. Uh, Ro Khanna, the Democratic congressman from Silicon Valley, who was a proponent of this originally, he's, he's all sour on it, but he blames the Treasury for not doing regulations that were tighter. Ron Kind, a Democrat from Wisconsin, who was also an early proponent of Opportunity Zones, is annoyed that the governor of Wisconsin, uh, Scott Walker, a Republican, didn't pick the right zones, not enough in Scott K in, K in Kind's district. So I think that I, I, I think if it gets changed the way Washington works, something will be slipped into some big tax bill and we'll find out about it afterwards. The problem is that some people want to tighten the rules and some people want to make this more generous. Now, um, as the uh, director of the Hutchins Center, uh, you have two people, you had two people working for you uh, in the Hutchins Center. One was Ben Bernanke and the other was Janet Yellen, who I think now is Secretary of Treasury. So has Janet Yellen said what her view is on this? Have you ever had a chance to send your book to her? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, okay. President Biden campaigned on a promise to reform Opportunity Zones. Uh, the Yellen Treasury has done nothing except some minor uh, clarifications on Opportunity Zones. And none of the proposals that the White House has sent to the Hill, or as far as I know, the bills that are pending on the Hill, the, either the infrastructure bill or the Build Back Better bill uh, have any referred opportunity zones at all. Okay, so leaving aside the social policy, let's suppose uh, you had some money and you had a good opportunity zone investment that came to you that's going to create some jobs in some uh, part of the District of Columbia that's an opportunity zone. Would you regard it as a bad thing because you've written this book to invest in this? Or would you regard it as a good thing because you know a lot about it and uh, you think it might be a good way to defer your taxes and help the society? Well, first of all, I'd have to have I'd have to have some capital gains that I wanted to invest. Um, the short answer is, I, I don't think writing the book would prevent me from investing in an Opportunity Zone project if I thought that was a good idea. Um, I would, as you did at the beginning of this, have to explain to people that I had done that. So I probably wouldn't do that until the book was uh, right. percolated a while. You know, I would say I, I have, um, it's been public knowledge that, uh, that I've been uh, looking at a project in Bunker Hill which is designated an opportunity zone in the Boston area. But uh, if I personally invest in it, um, I'm not sure I would take advantage of the opportunity zone provision because 
to do that, you have to hold on to something for 10 years. Right. I'm 72 years old. I'm not that focused on holding on to things for 10 years. So it, it has some pluses and minuses, but Absolutely. maybe for other people, not for me, I'm not a generally a tax minimizer. So, but I can see why some people might want to do it. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And some, like uh, Martin Wodo told me that from if you're doing affordable housing in South LA, you love the fact that investors who come to you are the ones who are willing to lock up their money for 10 years. So that is that is a constraint on how much money's going there. And so you have to be patient. But there are funds that are set up that you can get some return halfway through. And there are, I've been to a couple of Opportunity Zone conventions and it's just extraordinary the amount of ingenuity of people panels about how to marry your opportunity zone with your estate plan and uh, how to take advantage of the opportunity zone tax break with the low income housing tax break and the brownfields uh, tax break so I think there I what I worry about is this may be doing more to help people who want to avoid their taxes than helping them more than it's helping the communities that are getting the money I don't think that was Sean Parker's intention, but I think that's where we may have ended up. So uh, while I have you for a few more minutes, we have available before we have questions from those who are watching. Um, you are one of the great Fed watchers uh, in Washington. You've written a book about the Fed. Um, what is your view on whether Jay Powell is going to be reappointed? I, I think it's highly likely that Jay Powell will be reappointed for a second term, but it's not a sure thing. I'm puzzled by the White House has taken such a long time to make a decision on this because there's so much uncertainty in Washington now and around the world, COVID and inflation and, and China and all that. Uh, this is most of it beyond the control of the president. I don't understand why they don't make a decision. I have some theories on that. Um, the reason, if he doesn't get reappointed, it'll be in part because there are people who think that you shouldn't reappoint a white male Republican who had worked at Carlisle with you, when you have a, a perfectly qualified female Democrat in Lael Brainerd, who's likely to be tough on financial regulation. So they can't say there's not another candidate. But I believe that for a couple of reasons. One, I think that Janet Yellen and Joe Biden both understand that it would be good for the long run to have a Fed chairman who's reappointed, as opposed to this being something where you change the jersey every time you get a new president. And secondly, um, he's done a pretty good job. And many there are people on the left who think it would be nuts to replace him because he's been so outspoken about the employment side of the Fed mandate and about using the Fed's power to reduce inequality that they think like, why, you'll never get another Fed chairman who's more sympathetic to what they want than him. Also, you have to get these people confirmed. Yes. And um, if you were going to take a liberal Democrat and try to get that person confirmed, I'm not sure you can get 51 votes in the Senate. Uh, and if you're going to um, have a very conservative Republican, I'm not sure you can get uh, that many votes right. for that person either. So Jay Powell's kind of in the middle, and I think he's very confirmable in my view. I totally agree. He, some Democrats, Elizabeth Warren, will vote against him, but there are enough Republicans who will vote for him. Uh, one of his great skills as a Fed chair has been courting Congress, and I think he's done that very successfully, there were very few members of Congress who uh, sided with Donald Trump when Donald Trump was uh, taking a bludgeon to Jay Powell's head. Um, so I think the reasons there, there I think that one, one reason that this is being, is complicated for the White House, besides the fact that they got a lot of things on their plate is they have, there's two vice chair jobs at the Fed that are becoming available. There's one empty seat on the board of governors so it may be a more complicated thing than just do I repoint Jay Powell. So to conclude, before we have Tony uh, ask some questions uh, from everybody that's watching, I would just say I did read this book and enjoyed it. I wrote a blurb for it, so I obviously enjoyed it, and it's very well done. And and I can't say that I'm overly uh, um, shocked at what I read about how Washington works. I've been here for 40 years, so I can't say that I am just playing the piano and is shocked at what's going on upstairs. But this does give you a lot of insights into it. And I think it's a well-written and well-researched book. So David, congratulations on it. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And um, I just want to remind viewers that they can put questions uh, for David in the Q&A box. Uh, David, I'm, I am curious. You mentioned how uh, Senator Tim Scott was a real strong pusher uh, in moving this forward because he wanted to help 
uh, poor areas. What's his reaction to the way the uh, the thing turned out? Well, um, I think that Tip Scott is a really interesting guy. Uh, to get elected as a black man in South Carolina, you you have to be conservative. And so as a member of the House, uh, before he became a senator, he was appointed senator initially by Nikki Haley and then elected on his own right. He uh, had a track record as being very conservative. He voted to repeal the Affordable Care Act. He's, he was in favor of lower taxes. So um, I think he is uh, someone who believes strongly that we ought to, you should reduce taxes and you should use the tax codes for incentives to get people to invest in uh, where the government thinks the money ought to go and is in favor of, talks a lot about opportunity. He has his own opportunity to own agenda and stuff. He did not seem very, when I talked to him, he did not seem very concerned about the things that had happened with opportunity zones. He thinks that um, local communities have zoning roles and they can decide what they want. And I think that, um, and so uh, uh, I, th I think he, he thinks that it's working the way it should. And, if you want to, if you're a real believer in opportunity zones, you can find lots of examples that make you feel like it's working. And if you're a critic, you can find lots of examples that you don't, that you think it isn't. Uh, he has, he has put legislation in to require more reporting, which was in the original bill, but he has not been at all publicly critical of them. In fact, he celebrates them at every opportunity. Well, you, you mentioned earlier the example you gave of the Ritz Carlton. How, how is that? an opportunity zone? Well, um, so the census tracts in Portland, Oregon, in downtown Portland that were designated opportunity zones were eligible because not very many people live there and the people who live there tend to be in subsidized housing. Uh, Portland did a good job when it was uh, doing urban renewal of preserving some pockets of affordable or low-income housing. So these census tracts that when you look at them on paper, there are not very many people who live there and the people who live there tend to be poor. When you walk around, it's like some small housing and a lot of skyscrapers. So that's, and, the, and it was designated by, with their eyes open by the state with, who felt that, that this would give a little more impetus to get development in places of downtown Portland that were beginning to boom. Unfortunately, there's a community of immigrants called Rockwood outside of Portland, which is also an opportunity zone. And despite the best efforts of some community development people there, they got nothing or not nothing or barely almost nothing. So that's the problem with the law. Uh, if the zones had been described more precisely in the law or the treasury had written regulations, downtown Portland might not have qualified. Yeah, and the same thing kind of in reverse, the, an area in um, Baltimore, I think, that you refer to, um, which could use the money, could use the infrastructure, um, gets ignored. Yeah, there's a, a, a pastor in Baltimore uh, named Dante Hickman, who is uh, both a minister of a Southern Baptist Church and a little economic development operator on, on the side. And he's done a lot in his neighborhood in East Baltimore to, uh, uh, they built a senior housing thing and they have some other stuff going. And his initial reaction was opportunity zones are like what I've been waiting for. And he went to the White House, uh, even though it wasn't popular with a lot of black people in Baltimore and stood next to the president when the president was touting opportunity zones and gave this, you know, this is like the best thing that ever happened to East Baltimore. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I really appreciate this. And he's completely done a 180. He's completely soured on them. They got no opportunity zone money. He found that the investors were just not interested in the kind of risks you have to take to invest in East Baltimore. And so I think that's like an, uh, that really one of the things that really influenced me in coming to some conclusions. And when you write a book, you have to come to some conclusions with the evidence you have. Yeah, I remember years ago, when I was with CNN, we did a, a whole series on uh, how it is dangerous to be poor. You live in a poor area, everything costs more. You may not have a car, so you pay a taxi or a bus to get from place to place. Grocery stores are not convenient. And if they are, they cost more. And so those are the kinds of areas 
that you would think, I mean, they're the areas that need money, need investment. Um, but as you say, the, the risk for investors uh, too right. high. So in some of the other federal programs, like I mentioned, the new markets tax credit, um, because there's a limited number of dollars available for that, and because the treasury has some, gets to ration the money, they can direct the money to places like that. But Sean Parker and EIG felt that that limited the amount of money that rich people were willing to put into these things. So they had, I think, an, a naive faith in the market, that the market would drive, sure, some money would go to Ritz-Carlton's in Portland, but most of the money would go to the places that they had in mind. Um, I don't think they appreciated, A, how sloppy the law was, the idea that you can designate places that are already gentrifying or that the data was old so that they had already recovered from the Great Recession and were booming. Uh, Austin, Texas, the city government asked for four opportunity zones. The governor of Texas gave them 21, and Austin is one of the fastest growing metro areas in the country. They really don't need any, any help. Um, so I think that they also underestimated just how clever and assiduous the tax avoidance industry is. In the book, I described going to an Opportunity Zone Expo at the Mandalay Bay Hotel in a, in a casino in Las Vegas in the spring of 2019, and it was like a modern day gold rush. There were like dozens, hundreds of people, many of them tax lawyers and accountants and wealth managers and real estate fund managers, all trying to be middlemen to get people with money who wanted to avoid taxes and people who wanted to investment. And those people are really good at figuring out how to uh, read the law and the regulations and figure out how to use it for the purpose of saving money for their clients, which they're legally entitled to do, without regard to the social benefit. Uh, you mentioned gentrification. That's what we we often see when money is invested in uh, in poor areas. That it suddenly becomes unaffordable for the people that were there that was designed to help in the first place. Right. So I think gentrification is is more complicated than sometimes the headlines make it out. Um, there are some. There is some academic evidence that in many cases, when neighborhoods start to gentrify, it benefits the people who are already there. But you're right that the problem is that if all you do is fund something that turns uh, lousy rundown row houses into fancy condos and all the poor people are pushed out, then you have done, you may have helped the people who live in those, who buy those condos, you might even have done something for the tax break, tax base in that town, but you haven't helped the people. So many of the previous proposals that used uh, the tax code to get money into poor neighborhoods required uh, some kind of employment. And you, or maybe one solution to this is that you, if we have to live with the Opportunity Zone tax break, it should be become more generous to people who invest in the very worst neighborhoods and be some requirement that the people who live in the neighborhood get some benefit from it. Uh, David Rubenstein, you know about investment what keeps an investor from putting their money in a poor area? Well, generally, a poor area is one that uh, is not going to have uh, robust economic activity. So you are likely to lose money if you go into a poor area that doesn't have good workers, doesn't have good infrastructure, uh, doesn't have good, uh, uh, I would say, access to transportation and things like that. The appeal of something investing in the poor area is that you can get things at a very, very low price. You might overcome the factors I just mentioned. I understand the concept behind this, and I think probably it was well-intentioned. Again, I don't think uh, Sean Parker uh, was interested in uh, making money for this for himself off this. I think he was basically think he was doing something good uh, social policy-wise. The constraint in this law, and, and I've looked at it, is that you have to jump through a number of hoops. One of them is you have to have a capital gain in a relatively recent period of time. So not everybody will have that, some will. Secondly, to get the full advantage, you have to invest in something for 10 years. So you know, lots of people like to say they're long-term investors, but um, are you really gonna invest in something for 10 years? Now there's a loophole through that, that 
uh, David uh, and Tony may not be that familiar with the way the investment world works. Let's suppose you have a capital gain and uh, it's $100, as I said, and you want to uh, shelter that $100 or the $25 you would pay and say on capital gains and, and maybe more because you're paying state taxes. So you put the $100 in an investment that's in an opportunity zone. You have to hold it for 10 years and it appreciates in value. Well, you can borrow against that appreciation without having any tax consequences. In other words, if the 100 becomes worth 300 um, and you don't really want to hold on for 10 years, uh, you can borrow against the appreciated value most likely. And so you will get some money back more or less tax free before the 10 year period is up. Uh, David, do you follow me? Yeah. 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 So, so that's what people like you're going to be giving personal finance advice here, David. So that's what some people are doing. Um, the thing that I think uh, would be of some concern to people like me is that uh, you have an industry where uh, David and he went to Las Vegas and saw it. You've got people who are, let's say, middle income people who are, are, are modestly wealthy. They can't afford to go make a big investment themselves. They're not going to be able to put in a million or five million dollars in some opportunity zone. They can maybe put in one hundred thousand dollars or or one hundred fifty thousand dollars and they want to avoid a capital gains. I think that the transaction costs and the upside for them is probably not going to be worth it. I also wonder whether they're really going to understand that you have to hold on for 10 years, even though you might be able to borrow against it. So I'm not sure everybody in Las Vegas selling this to everybody is really disclosing how complicated it is to, to, to this. And so I have looked at a lot of opportunity zones in my uh, in a family office, and um, you know it's not easy to do. Um, you've got to be finding the right circumstances. So I think it's well-intentioned, and I should disclose the other night, on happen chance, I was at the Michael Milken investment conference and he asked me to do a talk at a, somebody's home. So I get to the home and it turns out to be Sean Parker's home. So, uh, and, um, you know, we did talk briefly about this and, uh, you know, anyway, um, very interesting uh, individual. I'll say that for sure. You told me, David, that he, he seemed to be aware of the, you have given a blurb for the book. And he he did. He was that. aware that I'd written a blurb for the book. And uh, I would say, uh, you know, he, I think he would regard your book as not as favorable to the opportunity zones as he would like. I think that'd be a fair statement. Is that right? I think that's fair. Right. But on the other then, hand, you know, no, um, go ahead. On the other hand, uh, as they say in Hollywood, um, you know, where he more or less lives, as long as they spell your name, right. doesn't make much difference. So I, you look, got his I name think, spelled right. I think he comes out looking pretty smart. He had an idea. He hired some smart guys to do it. He didn't get burned like Zuckerberg did on the immigration reform thing. Right. Uh, in, a, in a way, it's like a template. And he didn't spend that much money, you know, less than $15 million he put into EIG than his campaign contributions. But I think that um, he and his allies, they expected me to write a book that was more favorable to opportunity zones right. than it turned out. But the interesting thing is just usually when you get these kind of books, you find that the person who is trying to get something through Congress is trying to make money for himself or his client or his company. And that wasn't the case here. No. He had a well-intentioned purpose. Maybe it was more complicated because of the uh, complications of Washington, D.C. and getting something through Congress. And some of the things he wanted just couldn't get through Congress. But in the end, uh, I think he did a reasonable social uh, well, benefit. Okay. I would say that uh, you know, at some point we'll figure out whether it works or not. But I wouldn't say it's the worst law that's ever come out of Congress. Well, that's a pretty high standard. I think the issue is that he spent more time trying to figure out how could he get people to put money into opportunity zones than he did thinking about how to write the bill so that it would be moved in the right direction. Okay. And then, well, then as we wrap up, what hope is there for people who live in depressed areas of getting people to invest in their area and invest in them? I would say uh, people that live in those areas should focus on other things, because I don't think that uh, the effort to find a, the perfect investor investing in this area is going to be that easy to do. And so I, I wouldn't count on this as solving their problems. They may, they may find somebody that is interested, but it, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to get all the jigsaw puzzle pieces together. Thank you. Okay, Tony, you're muted now. You're muted, Tony. Oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. I was just thanking, thanking both of our Davids and uh, reminding folks that the, uh, the book 
only the rich can play acapella books has them and they've got autographed book plates and i think they also have uh david rubenstein's book uh, the american experience dialogues on a dream so thank you both thank you all for watching and have a good evening thank you all very much thank thanks you. a lot bye